Hello, good to see you. Uh, you can do the channel at the bottom of Zoom. Można wybrać wersję językową na dole w Zoomie. So if you prefer English, please choose English. And if you prefer Polish, please choose Polish. Jeśli wolisz polski, wybierz polski. Teraz mówiłam na ogólno, więc wszyscy powinni mnie słyszeć. It's five on my clock right now. So I think we want to start. In. Let's validate the time and all our guests. Czy ja mam mówić po polsku, czy mogę mówić po angielsku? Będę mówić po angielsku. Będzie łatwiej chyba tłumaczyć. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, good afternoon to all of you. Welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to... Uh, conduct this session, the first session of today's uh, afternoon with uh, Polish Association for DBT. I'm very pleased, I'm super pleased to welcome our special guest, Alan Fruzetti, uh, Professor Alan Fruzetti, uh, mentor and trainer of DBT, who is responsible for a very big and rapid growth of the number of DBT therapists in Poland. And he's also the developer of a family connection program, uh, which is a free 12 week training program for parents that we have been successfully implementing in Poland since, I think 2018, this will be almost three years. I'm very pl pleased to see more than hundred people from Poland and from other countries in Europe. Some of them, my colleagues from Ireland, from from, from Italy, I see from Spain, that's great. And this is, this is actually the, the example, the, the small example, how it is when you step into DBT world of therapies and, and teachers and into family connection, we all growing and developing a network of professionals and families supporting our patients and our beloved family members. So I'm very happy to host the first session today, which will be interview with Alan about his personal growth and personal way towards DBT and family connection and how things are from his, his perspective. Welcome, Alan. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. This is um, a lovely opportunity. and. Thanks everybody for coming to this, uh, what sounds like a, a really nice uh, evening uh, with lots of people uh, who've done a lot of really great things. So great. Yeah, great. I was about to start and ask you, how are you feeling today? But I rather a bit uh, change my question into how are you feeling? after being a DBT therapist and a DBT trainer for more than 30 years, I guess, mm -hmm. and being uh, one of the, the, the creator, the developer with, along with Perry for Family Connection Program for almost 20 years. How are you feeling with, when you realize this? How are you feeling about that? What's your, what's your reflection? How does it feel to have such a great achievement, which are not just on the paper or on the certificate, but you really changed the life of thousands of people. Well, my, my first reaction when you asked me this is uh, how I feel, I feel old. <laughs> so, um, that's, I know that's not quite what you're asking, but that was the first thing I noticed when you said, you've been doing this for more than 30 years. Yeah, I feel old, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, um, but there you are. Um, you know, I, I think that um, first, I, I'm i just so happy at how much DBT has progressed and how much Family Connections has progressed. Um, I have to say, and when I started learning DBT in the 1980s, um, there was just one DBT program in the world and nobody else ever heard of it. It was just Marshall Linehan's team in Seattle. And I was just lucky enough to end up there. I did my 
master's training and my doctoral training at the University of Washington, Seattle, and ended up meeting Marsha and she recruited me to be her co-therapist. And that was just my dumb luck. I, I take no credit for that whatsoever, whatsoever, other than my willingness to say yes and recognizing a, a good opportunity when one's there. At the time, I have to say, I don't think any of us really thought that DBT would be more than a niche, you know, a small mm -hmm. thing that might be picked up here and there for people with really severe problems. And, uh, and in fact, it, that's not what happened. DBT took off right away and it's just continued to grow ever since. And that's, of course, uh, largely uh, due to Marshall Linehan's incredible work building the treatment and, and getting it out. Family Connections is actually not so different. When, when Perry Hoffman and I uh, discussed creating this program, it was actually, uh, it started out a little bit as an afterthought uh, of trying to understand. We both were doing a lot of work with families and recognized that at least in the American system, it's very hard for families, parents, partners, siblings, grandparents, children to find useful services when they have a loved one with borderline personality disorder or suicidality. Um, and so we were trying to figure out what we could do uh, to set our own clinics. And then we realized that, that this was so important. We, we couldn't get it into the mental health system um, for lots of reasons that I suspect are not only true in the, in the United States, mental health system, but are probably true in other places as well. Mm -hmm. Although I think they're particularly difficult in America with, without a single payer, without any national health care, um, and with insurance companies refusing essentially to pay for family services in general. So we decided to go outside the, the traditional system. And we really had no idea that this was going to take off other than at that time I was working out in, out in the West and Perry was in New York. And we thought, well, at least we'll have two places where people have access to these resources. And, and, and here we are um, with Family Connections in, I think, 25 countries and uh, people like Daniel and Mary who are here, who are, and you, Magda, who are teaching Family Connections in Europe and other people who are teaching Family Connections in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and South America and Asia. And so it's really, I just, it just warms my heart. Yeah. And I feel old. Okay. So we can say that after all these years of experience, you feel warmth in your heart. Absolutely. That's, I think that's great. I wish the same for myself. So if we relate again, I'm sorry, Alan, but we'll, I will stay a bit with your experience at age. <laughs> so can you sure. share, because in our profession and working with families as a family leader, family supporter or the therapist, it's said that we are high risk of being burned out by mm -hmm. working and interacting with people. Mm -hmm. Is it anything in DBT which is special or in the family connection program? For the time being, I'm putting these two together that protect against burnout, you find it in yourself? That's a really great question. I, I, I think yes, in both, both in DBT and in family connections, and I think they're a little bit different. So in DBT, uh, we have this idea of having a consultation team all the time, not just getting consultation when we get stuck, but having it all every week, all the time, regular part of our work to get support from colleagues, which is really good for our motivation and not to burn out, but also helps us really continue to do good work, help each other provide the best DBT we can do. You know, one of the biggest sources of burnout, of course, is, is the struggle to have good outcomes. When, when we work with people who have serious problems, there are high dropout rates. Um, there are high rates of relapse and mm -hmm. self-harm and, and suicide attempts and so forth. So a treatment that does better on those things, and DBT has much less dropout, for example, than other treatments against which it's been compared, and better outcomes overall compared to other treatments we've been compared to. That's by itself, just having a more successful treatment contributes to lower burnout. Then having a team to really help us stay focused and really continue to do good work and to support us 
makes a big difference. And of course, the those are all undergirded. They're all sitting on the platform of mindfulness, um, which allows us to, to take our own experience seriously, to focus on acceptance and change, to, to do things so that we don't burn out. Our job is not to burn out. If I burn out, I can't help anybody. Um, and so it's my job not to burn out. And I got to take my own emotions seriously. DBT therapists take that very seriously, do good self-care. Um, so that we actually have the ability to come back into the next session and be really present and able to do the best we can um, without burnout. Obviously, if I sat with you, Magda, just, just as a friend, and I'm really feeling burned out, I mean, that's not as much, that's not as much fun for you, <laughs> okay? It's just, it's more, more complicated. So in, in Family Connections, we have some of the same thing, but Family Connections has this, this other piece, which is, that is an entirely voluntary experience, right? Um, professionals or family members choose to, to learn and then lead family connections because they want to, because they like to. Uh, and that the fact that it's voluntary makes a big, a big, big difference, right? I, I have to tell you after 20 years of family connections, when I look around at my Family Connections colleagues and the, the, the literally now thousands of Family Connections leaders who volunteer their time and energy and caring, I can't help but feel a deep sense of appreciation uh, and, and just love for people who do that. That's, and that, that's, that's enough to keep me motivated. Um, I feel part of this very large group and am so appreciative for all that people give back. Um, so, and then of course we have within Family Connections a network for support for each other. Lots of things that we do for leaders to help leaders not get burned out, to help them stay in their role and, and be able to come and go, be able to be very active and helpful um, at leading Family Connections, but also to not take it home and, and, and take it personally. So I think all these things mm -hmm. contribute to, um, I, I, I actually feel like I have just as much energy as I did 30 years ago though. So I'm not sure I say, when I say I feel old, it's more up here than someplace else. See, I, I, would, even, I would even think that it may really charge and recharge your energy. Absolutely. Yeah, and the more, that's the experience of me uh, leading family connection class that people say I'm feeling recharged like every week I'm charging my batteries that's great and if if we can stop on family connection because you said about the voluntary thing mm -hmm. I think that like whoever is here and know a bit about family connection know at least that this 12 week program for the family members we meet every week for two hours we have materials we work we do practice and family connection, uh, for me, it, it, it balanced two things. From one side, you and Perry uh, made it in the way that this is voluntary, this is free to participate. No one can be turned back from, from the program because right. of not having the money and the work of the leaders in voluntary base. So it's kind of, we can say, like an open thing. And at the same time, the rules of uh, and, and fidelity, you put a like, strong uh, outline on fidelity and the construction of the program. So it's kind of like rigid. You can, it cannot be adapted from 12 weeks to eight weeks or with like half time or with the speed up a bit or we just give materials to people, they do self-study. Like, like, what is the idea behind that, that you just did not do like, completely free, we made the program, we published, do whatever you want, or mm -hmm. you have not decided, oh, that's something that can be a good product. Like, mm -hmm. what is the yeah. idea behind that, if you can? Right, there, there, there are two, two main ideas behind that. Um, one of which is, is that we only want to provide the program, the best program that has the best evidence. So when we do research that says, okay, this is having a, a positive impact for, for, for participants, we want to, and that's the thing that we've studied, that's the thing that we wanna offer people. And although modifications could improve it, they also could take away something really important. So until we know that something is just as good or it maybe improves it, 
we we try to stay within within the the framework that that we've studied. That's I think a really important concept in general for for any service that's provided. Um, so we have ex by the way we have expanded. So we now have not only this twelve week version, but because of the pandemic, we also have a we have a, a weekend. We call it a weekend. It doesn't have to be on the weekend, but uh, one longer day a week for several weeks. You know, one six hour day for on Zoom for three weeks or a Friday, Saturday, Sunday that are all together. Uh, and we do have evidence that that seems to provide slightly different, but, but very helpful outcomes for people. So the evidence is a big, a big part of it. The, the other reason to keep within the, the frame, and it's loose within the frame, right? I mean, we don't say you have to do this in week one and this in week two. It's really leaders have a lot of wiggle room to and how they teach and and so forth, but but the framework and again also takes the burden off leaders um, to do something different or uh, to stray from things that actually have a lot of evidence. Um, they're also by nature uh, in a twelve week program or a twelve session program. There are a lot of things that we leave out about borderline personality disorder, about emotion dysregulation, or, and so forth. We leave them out purposefully um, for a variety of reasons. And so sometimes there's pressure from someone in the group, they've read something on the internet, why don't we include that? Um, there are two reasons for that, possibly. One is because it's not good science, um, it's not working well. And of course, the other possibility is that even if it's good science, anything we pull in, something else has to be pulled out to make room for it. So, so we try to take the burden off leaders to not have to respond to demands to, to change it, to actually like have expertise, get good training, good support, and then offer the program that they know and that, and that has evidence. So it's, it, it looks at all the countries, we know that more than 20 countries right now. So whenever people join the uh, family connection program, and then no matter where they are, they actually are learning the same. They get the same knowledge. They get the same yep. skills that they can apply. You might really, did, did you expect that it will be so universal, <laughs> ac applicable ac across the cultures? Well, I, I have to say that that actually was part of our original hope. Um, in, in the hope. US, that was our hope, right? Um, I, I can't say I... Oh, I, I should probably, you know, my, my my dear friend and colleague Perry Hoffman, as many of you know, died uh, a year and a half ago. Um, and Perry, Perry did not. She, she did not know the word. No, nie jest tak źle, ale widzimy, że trzeba coś zrobić, żeby nie było. Sorry, I just muted. Yeah. That's okay. So um, Perry certainly hoped. Perry had nothing but hope. Um, so I. I and that was really good. I, I'm not hopeless, but I'm I'm not quite as full of like positive expectations as she was. So we we actually made a good partnership in that respect. Um, but but because of the the American very distinctly uh, problematic American mental health care system, we purposefully were trying to construct uh, a program that was culturally sensitive, sensitive to people of different incomes different ethnic groups, different racial groups, different regional groups. Um, because in the US, there are huge problems of access to mental health care and they fall disproportionately on poor people and people of color. So we were intentionally trying to create a, a, a actually a reasonably sensitive program that, that could genuinely fit for just about anybody. Um, so that was our purpose. And, uh, other than language changes. And of course, whenever we translate things, we have to translate them into a cultural context. It's not just a, a literal translation. So there's sensitivity in doing that. But yeah, that was our hope from the beginning, or it was my hope too, but I, I wouldn't say I expected it. Perry, I'm sure, fully thought we would be right where we are. That's what I think that Perry would be the person yeah. who would say, of course we will do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> She would, yeah. So I think this is this is the thing that very special thing about the program. Although it's quite uh, strict about the, the 
the, the principles in the program and the, the modules and everything and also the framework but this because of the structure i think that's right. why that why this can be applicable really across the culture and, and we find it very successfully applicable in poland yeah plus the idea of make it free voluntary based and open yeah? right what what something else was behind that you were not afraid that uh who gonna do it if people will not get paid didn't you have this risk i'm asking you not perry because <laughs> i'm sure she was enthusiastic about it so so you know i i would say this is something that perry and i were were, were pretty equally committed to mm -hmm. um under you know perry came from uh, a background where she treated lots of people underserved people as as do i and uh you know i i ran a free clinic for 25 years because people don't have access. So I think we were both acutely committed to this idea of of access. And you know, if you're going to have if you're going to have a free program, you know, you, there there aren't that many ways to do it. And so we thought, well, um we'll set an example. I mean, I I I'm sure you know that neither Perry nor I never earned a penny from Family Connections or any ABPD, right? We're, we're entirely voluntary. Um, and so we set an example and trained. And it wasn't hard to find these wonderful people who were willing to, you know, say, gee, this was really helpful to me. I want to pay that forward and help another group of people. Um, and that's just lovely. And now, of course, it's, it's a bit broader, right? Because in other countries that have national health care or single payer systems, professionals can actually do family connections as part of their job, which is also wonderful. I, I, I have no problem with people, people getting paid for their work. That's, that's fine. That, that's the way the world works. Um, but the people who come in to get the program still have access to it. It's still free for them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this has been our commitment from day one. Um, and um, and I'm glad that we stuck with it. You know, there have been times when it was tempted to say, well, if we just charge a little bit of money, then, you know, the organization has more money and we can do other things. Um, but I think that it's been very healthy for Family Connections to be set up this way. And the, the, the enormity of the expansion, uh, I think, is something of a testimony to that. I think so. I, I think this this paid off by itself, like by the having people committed and engaged across across the world. And then I thought one more idea that what you said that in some it's clear. No, tak, ale jeszcze nie zdążyłam z nią porozmawiać. Nie. The person. Someone needs to mute the person i cannot do it okay so uh so one thing you said the professional can can jump into that and that's how we started in poland and i know in many countries that's how it started Absolutely. that especially when we have public healthcare system that people can you know use the, the timing that they work at the clinics uh, the other thing is sometimes it's difficult to change the system that it's there and introduce something new right. but i also see family connection as a huge way magnificent way of empowering families right because i cannot i cannot think about anything else any other uh, um, program that would actually look at the patient environment see it in this way of transactional model and say not only we're going to fix and treat the patient but we want to invite the family not just to find responsibility or tell them to change but actually help them to change without blaming and empower them. So th this, this I find it as a great, uh, great gain of the program. Absolutely. Do you have some, some personal experience of running the group and seeing, you know, how the family member, how they grew, how they, they change, or do you keep in touch with, with them from, you know, your first or second or like five years or something ago? Absolutely. Um, so I, I think I really uh, I appreciate you're using the word empowerment um, because that's actually part of the goal. Uh, I'm fond of saying that 
skills create choices, right? If you have the skill to yeah. do something, ride a bicycle, then you have the choice. You can ride your bicycle. You don't have to, you can walk, you can take a bus, but you have another choice. Some situations, we don't feel like we have any choices. And so we don't have any skills for what's needed. And so skills create choices and having choices is empowering. Um, and, and that's really at the core. Um, education and skills and support, as you know, are the, the three pillars of family connection. Education about emotion dysregulation and about how families work, our transactional model. Um, skills uh, to, to manage our, our, our own emotions and, and to enjoy our loved ones more and to interact and transact in ways that are good for both. That's the, the both and, right? It's not just, well, this is good for me. It's not so good for you, Magda, but we'll do it anyway because it's good for me. Or I will sacrifice myself you know, for you. It's good for you, but bad for me. And family connections, no, 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 neither of those. Well, let's keep going. Let's find a solution that's good for both of us. Um, and that's very empowering because uh, as, a, as a family connections leader for all this time, but also as a family therapist for even longer, only 35 years, right? So I would say that most families that come in, either to family connections or to family therapy, everybody feels disempowered. And they often feel disempowered by the other person. And so helping both both in this case, let's just keep it to two people. It could be more than two. Helping people have more skills empowers both without disempowering the other. Um, and that's the goal. Um, it's, it's mutual empowerment and support. So, uh, and you asked about like, what have I noticed? I mean, well, we have our data, which I think speak for themselves. And certainly my experience is, is consistent with that. Um, the, the biggest, uh, way I can communicate this is, is this, the sheer number of people who go through family connections and then want to want to be leaders, are willing to be leaders. They, they feel like they've gotten something out of this program that they couldn't get someplace else. They couldn't, it wasn't available to them. And they want to make sure that they have big hearts and they want to make sure that other people also have access to, to this material. And there's nothing in family connections that's judgmental or blaming. Uh, this is, uh, I hope the whole field has changed in the last 20 years, um, but I'm not sure it's changed quite as much as I'd like it to. I hope we continue to improve. But don't forget, it's not so many years ago, certainly in my professional lifetime, when the predominant models for things like borderline personality disorder were pretty dark, pretty hopeless, very blaming, um, and kind of ugly certainly judgmental and not, and by the way, without any data to support them, they were just from my perspective, not, not very nice models because, you know, and so here we have a model that's not dark, that's got hope built in. We can learn how to do things differently. And the motivation is to, it's good for you and for me, and therefore it's good for our relationship instead of this idea of I have to sacrifice myself for you. Mm -hmm. That's not mm -hmm. sustainable. I mean, that, that, that's, that's burnout in five minutes, right? Um, and guilt uh, and shame on your part. Um, so, or the other way around, you're gonna sacrifice yourself for me and, and that's the, it's just the same in reverse. So in Family Connections, we have this platform for helping people really get skilled up in ways that are good for them and good for their relationship and the other person. Very empowering. Uh, and I think ultimately very hopeful. Um, I think that's why 90% of people who take family, you know, roughly depending on where, but so somewhere between 88 and 92%. So I'll say 90% on average of people who, who start family connections actually complete the program, mm -hmm. which is remarkable for a 12 session program, yeah. uh, absolutely remarkable. In we the, have, in yeah, we have the same observation in Poland, very, very high compliance. And I think from Ireland was the same when we, when we learned about the data from other countries, that the compliance is very, very high for this program. And I'm, I want to move to something which is disempowering, but before I, I just had one, one reflection 
and thinking about what is so special about family connection, what is so special also about DBT. And then I found like I have to share that Alan is my my great teacher. I, I'm learning a lot from Alan. Perry, which I got to know, uh, Perry Hoffman, she was also a wonderful person. She gave me a lot of support and, and she kicked me, she pushed me a bit for doing many things. And what these two people had in common and so many other my colleagues from DBT and, and family connection, I would say, and this may be surprising, is the sense of humor and being able to get the distance and being able to be playful while with the group of people who, who beloved ones, they are severely dis dysregulated or the patient who, who are in the suicidal risk or who, who have no hope for their life. What I'm finding about DBT and family connection is, you know, life is as it is, not, not being judgmental and just, you know, being, having hope and being playful even around very difficult things. So I, I'm, I'm finding, you know, sense of, of humor and being able to distant and, and engage really and jolly on, in both area. And, and I'm thinking, what is your idea about how it work or why it's important or why as a therapist being in very serious role, mm -hmm. we can or we should allow ourselves for that. That's that's a great question, and it's also a question I'm very happy that you asked me because I, I as as you know, I have I have some thoughts about this. Um, I think that there there are many elements that go that come into play when we talk about being playful or using humor, or just to put it differently, just being a human being mm -hmm. in the moment, right? And so, in DBT, the idea is that although I might become someone's therapist, I don't stop being a fellow human being. In fact, we're human beings first, we have equal value. Um, and yeah, we have our roles and our roles define limits, right? We're not gonna work outside those roles, but we're also completely human beings within those roles. So they're always both true. Well, that seems kind of obvious in some way, but it's not the way psychotherapy was practiced in most schools. Uh, for the first hundred years of psychotherapy. I mean, there are some ex other exceptions, absolutely. DBT is not the only one, but certainly the more traditional therapies, it's all about the role, not, and the human being part's not so much present. Carl Rogers, actually, who's, who's a humanistic therapist, yeah, is the person who, who developed this, right? That he developed this in the 1950s. And, and Marsha borrowed or stole heavily from him. I mean, and gave him full credit for it, you know. That, but that's not the only thing, right? We're not only human beings, we're also therapists. And so we can also be pushy and, and, and so forth. So what this does is a couple of things. One is it allows us to see the person, not just the problem, not just a disorder. We don't use necessarily a lot of traditional psychiatric jargon. You know, we don't talk about disease. We don't talk about psychopathology, those big words that are sort of in some circles fun to use. We talk about problems because people have problems. Everybody gets dysregulated sometimes. Everybody does. I do. Sorry, Magda, I think you probably do too. Everybody does. Now, if, if it's seldom, that's great because we have time to repair and rejuvenate and our lives can be very stable. But if it's frequent, it's increasingly difficult and painful. So when we look at people who are struggling, who have a lot of pain, who are dysregulated often, we see the struggle and see the pain, but we also see a person. We don't see a disorder. And then we try to put the problem behaviors as skill deficits what does this person need to be able to do differently to have a better life, to enjoy their life more? Um, and so I think that's, that's part of it. Now, the, the playfulness is part of that. That's the connection. We're not, I think lots of, I've had many, many, many uh, clients or patients over the years tell me how blamed or judged they felt within the healthcare system or the mental health care system. Um, and our goal is certainly not to do that. It's to help people feel like complete 
lovely human beings and sometimes with very enormous problems that are really ruining their lives that we have to help them with. So the playfulness keeps us connected to the former. Uh, there's always a human being there and human beings, by the way, like one, one way to know that I like you is, is, to, is to be playful with you, is to tease, to, to have some fun, not at the exclusion of doing serious work, but to make it easier to do serious work. I don't know. So does that make sense to you? Am I answering your question? Said, Masha, she said that in DBT, we are just throw the hat that, that we right. open our office, we put the hat, and then the, the moment we leave, we remove the hat. We just, we just bring ourselves. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to say to everyone that by the end of our, our talk, we may have a few minutes for a couple of questions, one, two, maybe three questions from the audience. So please, if anyone has a particular question we, to Alan, we can, we can put it in the chat. But and in the meantime, I want to move, we talk about empowering and I want to move a, to disempowered and what you said about using the jargon and pathology and mental health disorder and go to the word that also Perry, she, she outlined it so many times and you were doing about the stigma, the problem, problem of stigma patient with borderlines and stigma of their family who are to blame for the development of, of BPD or who are not supportive enough. So maybe from, from you, and, and then in, in family connection, we, we take the approach that uh, the stigma is, is more among the professionals. It's more serious and more important among the professionals. That's the bigger problem than what we think among, you know, in, in general in public, in the society, that stigma is mostly there. And that, that's one of the, the biggest obstacle to get the right treatment on time. What do you think about it? And how can we deal with that? So I, I, I agree. I think uh, stigma among professionals has the potential to do the, the biggest amount of damage. Um, although I think there's plenty of stigma in our neighbors and our family, our own families uh, about mental health problems. So if we, if we think about it, stigma is, is a term that we apply it's kind of big and uh, describes a pattern of, of how people respond. Um, at an individual level, what people are doing that's stigmatizing, if you will, is typically judging, wagging the finger, you know, what's wrong with you, you know? Mm -hmm. It's invalidation and judgment, which is of course, comes out of either misunderstanding or people's own fear. So you're not unrelated, right? Fear and misunderstanding go together. So, but of course, when a person, whether it's a, a patient with BPD or a family member of that person are judged, criticized, invalidated by members of their own extended family or by professionals, healthcare professionals or mental health care professionals, there's damage, right? When it's a professional, the damage can include not having access to appropriate services because they're being judged and blamed. And therefore, you know, for a long time, for example, um, even, in, even in the early part of my career, I commonly heard professionals say things like people with BPD can't be treated. That mm -hmm. they, and they will... And I, I, I don't even want to repeat some of the very judgmental things that they would ascribe to people with BPD. Very negative, very judgmental. And I have to say in 35 years, not my experience at all. Not, not once have I had those kinds of experiences, which is not to say that they didn't, but I think that's part of their transaction, right? If you already are afraid of the, the person, right? If you... Magda, if, you're, if you have VPD and you come to me for treatment and I'm already afraid of you and you know, kind of keeping you at arm's length and not being a human being and what you're longing for is some help and to be understood, that sets up our transaction to be maybe problematic and, you know, and that could go badly. It's more likely to go badly. 
So to combat stigma, unfortunately, we have to, we, not just, I mean, professionals, it's great for us to do this, and we're doing this all the time, trying to help professionals understand that, yes, there there are good treatments for DBT, uh, for for borderline personality disorder, and not just DBT. There There are other treatments with good evidence and hopefully over time even more. Um, But more importantly, that there's an actual genuine human being with the capacity for love and caring and humor and and being dedicated to other people and doing good things in the world who also has a lot of suffering. And then from that perspective, approaching the person like, gee, you seem really like you seem very out of sorts, you know, uh, what's going on, just approaching it with curiosity and interest to try to understand the experience that people have, whether it's a person with BPD or a parent or a partner or a sibling or, or another loved one. That's the destigmatizing process is actually paying attention to what the person's experience is instead of judging it and scolding from a distance. Now, of course, the the hard part of that is the person with BPD or a a family member, a loved one, has to take the risk or what feels like a risk to say to, you know, a parent has to say to a sibling or a partner to his or her sibling, right, or a best friend, I'm really struggling with my spouse or with my child or with my parent, you know, Um, I'm really struggling with this person. This is what non-judgmentally, this is what it's like for me. And, and, and really hope the other person doesn't start wagging their finger and saying, telling you how simple it is to fix and how you just messed it up. And, and that's a risk, right? When we open our mouths and try to describe some of the suffering, some people aren't ready to tolerate it. And maybe that's not the person to go back to next time. But it's really important to keep trying because isolation increases shame. And exposure, t- telling your story to people who will understand and validate, decreases shame and is anti-stigma. So there are a lot of things built into DBT for professionals to help professionals reduce their stigma. Not least of which is continuing to publish studies showing how well people can do in treatment when they get good treatment, um, which is remarkable and very different the way people thought about this even 40 years ago. Um, And family connections, it's to help family members continue to reach out. They have their own group of other family members where they can relax and say, these people understand something about their experience. And that's often the very first thing that's, that's important to participants. Then there's education and skills, but the support might be the glue that ties it all together. We don't know because we've never tried to do family connections, you know, without with, skills, <laughs> without skills, or without education, <laughs> or without some kind of support. So, mm-hmm. uh, nor am I, frankly, honestly, that interested in trying it. You know, well, I think we're doing okay. So it's it's a hard mm-hmm. thing to change, but I think if we work at it from both sides, uh, there's a lot less stigma now than there was. Uh, mm-hmm. In the 1980s, when I was, you know, learning to be a psychologist, I mean, a lot less. I, I mean, I think of some of the things that I heard professionally, and they're deeply unsettling. And I, I mm-hmm. don't hear those things very often any longer. Uh, I think mm-hmm. our, our our culture of professionals has improved. There's way to go, absolutely, but I think it's better. Mm-hmm. And I think to just to summarize what you said. Uh, what you said that in DBT as a professional we have our ways we have our principles assumptions skills we have non-judgmental approach attitude and and, and and mindfulness to help us to be aware when we start being judgmental and and help to deal with the stigmatizing and the stigmatizing so I'm thinking and then we carry it to the families we like we model in the therapy in the DBT we, we model to the families like how we approach the problem so I'm thinking, and I don't know if you agree, that it's actually on our shoulders, on professional, a lot of work. And, and at the same time, we have great opportunities to use the language, non-stigmatizing language, language of description, 
and and to show to model the roles like how to help and how to solve the problem and how to understand because from my clinical observation is that with family coming they usually they don't have knowledge they are they are they are, they're traumatized they being ashamed by others they being blamed so they look at us professionals uh, like how how we approach the problem how we deal and and this is especially i i think in poland this is our role we are the, the the first who are supposed to work with the stigmatizing to to the stigmatize so i don't know if this was you can say that was the direction in the us new culture that it has this is the thing that has to go top down for the stigmatizing I yes, uh, I, I, I would say absolutely. I would also say that's not mutually exclusive from bottom up to help yeah, of course, others of overcome course. It yeah. and, and patients overcome it too. Yeah. Um, but I, I would actually even add a, a, a pushier step for professionals, which is to, to try to block and redirect other professionals when they are judgmental in a, in a kind way, right? It doesn't, it's not effective to judge people who are judging, right? That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. But to see that as, as a, as a, just as a judgment and as harmful and how can we help mm -hmm. them understand in a different way? Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's actually our responsibility to do everything you said. And when we hear, see in print, hear in a talk, or in a conversation, somebody being judgmental, blaming either people with BPD or their families to, be interested in, in what that experience is coming out of and providing another way of, of experiencing it that's less mm -hmm. judgmental, less pejorative. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that one of the one of the, 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 the first step or the main way of the stigmatizing is the change of the language that we use from the pathology to problem, from manipulating or intention to description of the problem behaviors? This is something that does not cost much. It's not something that you have to put effort to study what language to use. Just start more descriptive language and then that, that I, I completely, reach the gap. I completely agree. Uh, I think sometimes in professional circles, there's uh, some a premium on using more extreme language. It, it, somehow, like we're being really precise in, in, inside the group. Um, but of course, that's not my humble opinion anyway, I'm not sure that's all that helpful in the larger sense. I could see how it might connect professionals to each other, but it then distances them from everybody else. And that's a big cost, I think. Plus the judgmental part of the language, not just jargon, but the judgmental part is very damaging. It, it does a lot of damage. Um, it also models for everybody else in the mental health system, not just therapists and doctors and nurses, but also for the person who's sitting at the desk checking people in and, and you know, the, the custodial staff and, you know, everybody else. Like, these are, these are people that we're judging, which is awful. What an awful thing to do to somebody who's suffering. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that uh, there are many things we can do with, with language. Just underneath that, I think, is also the model that we chose, we choose to use. How do we understand the phenomenon? Or do we care about the person's experience at all and just stand outside and label it? Uh, or do we find ways of describing a person's experience and create a model that includes their experience? In, in DBT, we have a very big word for that, <laughs> phenomenological empathy, which means that we, we don't want to do anything that's not consistent with the person's experience, right? Mm -hmm. A model that says, oh, yeah, that yeah that's not what your experience is, but I'm sure I'm right. That's a very invalidating model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is the, 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 the thing of understanding and validation, what you use, the, the phrase and the hit not hand words you use when you when you listen and you observe you can understand when you understand you can do only but but loving someone yeah That's right. and in dbt and family connection we we have our big how to say i will not even 
say the tool, but our way, our map or our guide to understand, which is mindfulness practice, which is, I think, the, the, the base of, of how we are, a, why we are able to do it skillful by, by developing mindfulness, mindful, mindfulness in relationship. And this is, uh, yeah, what, what would you, I think we are just getting towards the end. And, and since we are, we just stop on, on stigmatizing, destigmatizing and then the language, could you share your perspective uh, and, and what do you, how do you see the role of mindfulness in both DBT and family connection? Because for some people, they will be, oh, mindfulness, this is some tricky, tricky, Zen, yoga, exotic things. Oh, I want to have skills, but not this mindfulness. So how, how you explain that, how you understand that? Yeah, uh, that's, a great, that's a great question. I think a really important one, because mindfulness is a psychological skill. Not, you can use it in the service of a spiritual practice. Uh, mindfulness actually comes out of Eastern, Zen and other traditions, but also out of Western existentialism and, and other contemplative practices. Um, but it's also a psychological behavior, right? And if we define it, the, the common definition is paying attention on purpose right now without being judgmental, right? It's just awareness of the present. That's hardly controversial, right? The idea is that, okay, if I'm driving in traffic, like how can I bring my attention to driving safely? That, that's, it's kind of hard to argue with that, right? I, so, and most people don't. So I, I tend to, to emphasize the psychological skill involved in mindfulness, recognizing that it, you can use it in the service of a lot of things the goal is not, for example, to be peaceful, but it's very hard when you really master some mindfulness practice, it's hard not to find more peace in your life. That's, it's, that's typically what people do because judgments often have a sharp edge and without judgments, there are fewer sharp edges. Um, so uh, I, I know that Marsha Linehan talked about the origins of mindfulness for her, but it's also true that mindfulness comes from many sources and uh, modern mindfulness uh, in psychotherapy, there are two kinds. One is more on the mindfulness meditation side, using mindfulness to focus on one thing as opposed to mindfulness, which is the more DBT way of doing it, which is using mindfulness to engage our lives in whatever we're doing. Um, and that meditation, for example, is not necessarily a part of DBT or family connections. Uh, meditation is not required. In fact, I don't teach people meditation at all. Uh, that's not because I'm against it. I think meditation is lovely. Yoga, I mean, all kinds of things can be very nice, you know, but it also can be very nice to stand on a paddleboard out in the summer and you know maintain your balance and enjoy the day. That's a mindfulness activity, right? If you lose your focus, you fall in, which is frankly not that big a deal because it's summer and it's hot and the water's refreshing. You know, so it's 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 a way of enjoying life, paying attention on purpose without those sharp-edged judgments. I, I, to, to balance what you say, which is, which is great, that this is the way of engaging our life and enjoy our life in both, in family connection, when we work with the family members and in DBT, when we work with patients, we also teach mindfulness to be, to be able to stay present when their life is not so fun anymore, right. when you suffer, instead right. of avoid or act on impulses. So this is, I think, the, the, the huge part in both in DBT, working with patient and the family members to, to teach the stress, distress tolerance skills based on mindfully observing. Yeah, and th this is the first module of the skills that we start and also this we teach on the family. And for some people, especially when they're highly suicidal or there is very strong emotion coming, emotional storm, they find it like a saver, it's like a lifesaver. It's, oh, I have my distance tolerance skills. Oh, I know 
what to do in the crisis. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that some skills, you know, are particularly helpful and you, you think that all people should have the skills in the crisis? What, what would you think? Yeah. This is tricky because I, I think of this very dialectically, like mm -hmm. when is that helpful and when is it not, right? Mm -hmm. So distress tolerance for many people who are in ongoing crisis situations with, with a lot of pain and a lot of reactivity, distress tolerance can be absolutely an amazing thing that helps people really get control over their actions. and reduce or eliminate really dangerous behavior. So it could be super helpful. In fact, the problem is that sometimes it's so helpful that people stop there, right? And of course, what that distress tolerance means that you've things have gotten worse and worse and worse. They feel more and more and more painful. And then you tolerate it not to do something like take drugs or attempt suicide. You tolerate the distress and try to bring it back down which is wonderful, right? Because it works and then you're not using drugs and you're not making a suicide attempt. There are many, many benefits. However, if months and months later, you're still using that strategy, you're still having to get very miserable before you have to feel miserable to feel better. And that's a lot of pain. And so it's really important for therapists and clients alike to start to use other skills, mindfulness and emotion skills way back at the beginning to manage the difficult situation before it gets particularly painful and save the stress tolerance for rare occasions when it gets really awful. Because I also think that how you said that how it is balancing in DBT and also for family members and family connection. And I think this is one of the therapy that it's straightforward said, you know what, I know you're suffering. It is painful. Pay right. attention to your pain, painful emotion. This is life how it is, this is how you can manage. Right. A rich life includes both exactly. great joy and sometimes great pain and hopefully more of the joy. But there, there might be months or even years where it's stacked the other way. And that's, that, is, that is a rich and meaningful life. Um, the capacity for the joy is still there. Alan, this is great, and I think we could carry on and carry on. Well, that would be fun for me. <laughs> that would be fun. And, um, and I see that we are just, you know, this is four to six, and at six, I think Daniel is, is, is bringing, which I, I invite everyone, because this will be follow-up and, 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 and dev developing on what Alan's saying about compassion and, and mindfulness and the part from the professional side, because and right. this is carrying on about DBT in in, in working with with uh, with adolescent population. So how this is in practice. And uh, and now I I just want to thank you for your time, for this one hour today, and for a couple of years of teaching me, <laughs> and teaching our our team in Poland and and teaching both DBT and family connection. So uh, we'll stop here. Okay, thanks so much. Thank for, you a lot, it was great. Uh, I'm gonna turn my camera off and uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to Daniel and to Mary. So uh, they're wonderful. Uh, and uh, thank you all for attending and um, be well. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, so this is going to be just a three minute technical break. I don't really remember what time Mary Kells starts her lecture.